<laughs> now, um, as you've heard from Matt, my name's Philip Marich-Kate, who is your uh, hostess for the evening. And uh, we're taking a little bit of a change of pace right now. We're going to just have a little look at the message and the meaning of Christmas. And then we're going to pray together before we do our final big, big uh, carols of the evening. But I want to ask you a question. And the question is this. Why are you here? Why are you here? Now, obviously, some of you are here because this is your church. This is the community that you belong to. And uh, you have made this your group, your family, your people, and you are here week in, week out. But some of you, you're here maybe for the very first time. And if that's you, I want to really welcome you. Or maybe that you've been a little bit around the margins, around the edges. You've been dipping your toe in and that you've been coming a little bit, but you wouldn't say that this is a regular thing for you. But Christmas brings out all kinds of people to church. It's the kind of thing where many people across the UK will go to church, will go to a carol service, because somehow we feel that we want to connect with something higher than ourselves. There was a survey done by um, a couple of cathedrals who wanted to know why so many people were coming to the carol services. And out of those people surveyed, 94% of them said, we come because we want to enjoy the music. You love carols, you love the tradition. It's great to have uh, Last Christmas and those kind of wham specials, but we want to have the good old carols. We want to have the sacred stuff. Now, if you go to a cathedral, you're going to get choirs, you're going to get orchestras. You come here, and like we said at the beginning, we're kind of informal, and uh, we do things our own way. But some of you are here just because you want to sing the carols away in a manger. Classic. 75% of people said they came because they wanted to be reminded of the Christmas story. Maybe that's you. Maybe you think, actually, there's so much crass commercialism around Christmas, all the materialism, the overindulgence, the overexpending. And uh, I just want to connect with the the story because it, it gives me hope. And actually, beyond that, 55 people said, we come because we want to feel close to God. We want to be reminded of the true meaning of Christmas. Now, maybe that you fall into one of those three categories. You come because you like the music, or you come because you want to be reminded of the story, or maybe you're here and actually you think there is something in me that wants to connect with something of hope, something special, something that elevates us. Christmas, in my eyes, it taps into a deep instinct within each one of us that we think there's got to be more to life than what we experience from day to day. There's got to be more to life than just chasing down the latest opportunities, working all week for the man, living for the weekend. There's got to be more to life than iPhones and Ikea. And Christmas gives us that urge to connect with something other, special. Christmas is a magical time. We instinctively want to be with one another. We want to connect with people. We want to reach out to one another. We want hope. We want reconciliation. But there's a problem with all this. We want the meaning of Christmas. But those same people, when they were surveyed, they were asked, do you believe it? 47% of people say, we just don't believe it. I want to feel close to God, but I don't believe it. And maybe if you're not used to church, if this is a kind of thing you've been dragged along by a friend, you came to do them a, a solid, and you're here, you can kind of identify with that. There's something every year at Christmas. We want to connect with the, the good, transcendent realities, but we just don't believe it. In fact, the 47% of people, they said, we don't believe that Jesus was born and laid in a manger. Because it just seems so twee, it seems kind of fairy taleish, doesn't mesh with our understanding of the real world. And so we're in this quandary because we feel like we want meaning at Christmas, but we don't believe the story. And so what are we left with? Now, when the Bible talks about the story of the birth of Jesus, actually a lot of the things that you find in the Bible actually contrast with what you hear in the carols. A lot of the time, our image of Jesus and Christmas comes from a carol that we have heard, or a film that we have seen, or a Christmas card that we have received. And there's a lot of misinformation, and there's a lot of kind of romanticism. A song like Away in a Manger, that was written by a couple of American guys in the 19th century, and it's full of sentimentality, and it has a kind of crazy unrealistic view of a baby that no crying 
he makes and he's surrounded by kind of lowing cows and all these kinds of things. And so you've got good reason not to believe it. But when the Bible talks about God coming down in human form, about the God that made us, the God that gives us value, worth, dignity, it says that God became a man to be close to us. And the reason that many of us don't believe it is simply we didn't recognize it. So the reading that we had at the beginning came from John chapter 1, and it says this, though he was in the world, so Jesus, God himself, though he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen that Bible verse before. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a church person, you probably never even heard that passage. But for me, it just seems like it's just a stunning thing to say. The Bible says it's not the fact that God is not real. It's the fact that we haven't recognized him. So much of the time, we're looking for meaning, looking for hope, looking for God, looking for the spiritual, the supernatural, and we're not recognizing it. Best Christmas party I ever had. I peaked early. I mean, I peaked super early. I was 12 years old, and I peaked early because I had the best Christmas party of my life when I was 12. This is the circumstances. I was brought up in York, and uh, I was a choir boy in York Minster Cathedral. So I was used to the pomp and circumstance. Every Christmas, we would, uh, we would have the nine lessons and carols. I'd be in my robes. I'd carry a giant candlestick, process in with all the boys, and uh, we would sing, I saw three ships come sailing in, and it was just magical. But if you knew what to do, you could make money out of it as well. And uh, I played the flute. I was pretty handy with the flute. And basically, the flute was good for me in my life for about one year when I was 12 years old. After that, it was just no good to me. No good to impress girls. No good to do anything else. But for one year, it made me fabulously wealthy, at least for 12-year-old standards. And that was in York, which is a kind of tourist town, cobble streets, shambles, medieval walls. At Christmas, you could go and you could busk. You could play Christmas cows. And so I was out there in my choir boy uniform. Super, super cute. I mean, I look good now, but at 12, I would just melt your heart. My flute, my um, uniform, I'm on the streets. I'm playing carols. And people are just dropping coins into my flute case. And I've been doing this for about half an hour, and this older guy comes up. I remember that he had this brown jacket on. He comes up, he says, son, I can't give you any money. I said, this is no good for me. He says, I can invite you to come and play at my party. And I'm thinking, you do realize that sounds super creepy. And he says, listen, here's my card. I'm going to have a Christmas party on Saturday, and uh, you can come. I said, can I bring my case and make money? He says, yeah, you can bring your case. Everything that you make, you keep. But uh, you talk to your parents, see if they will be happy, and uh, come if you want on Saturday. It's my big Christmas party. And then off he went. And I was about to throw the card away when all of a sudden, out of a guest shop, uh, a gift shop, my mum's friend, her German friend, Heidi, she came running out and she said, Philip, do you know who that was? And I said, no, just a creepy old man who wants me to play at his party. That's so skanky. She says, listen, that is the Lord Mayor. Now, in a city like York, Lord Mayor, it's like the, there's the Queen and then there's the Lord Mayor. It was just pomp and circumstance. And I had seen the Lord Mayor in the cathedral from time to time because he'd come in, he'd have the big cloak, the big robes, it's like black rod, he's got huge gold chains, gangster style around his neck, funny hat flanked by stormtroopers, just the most imposing figure. And uh, I didn't recognize him because he didn't have any of that stuff on. But my mum's friend from the gift shop, Heidi, she says, that's the Lord Mayor. You've been invited to the mansion house. You must go. The thing is, I did not recognize him. I said, well, why didn't he tell me he was the Lord Mayor? And she said, maybe he didn't want to make it weird. Maybe he didn't want to put you under pressure. Maybe he wanted to leave you with the choice. Maybe he just wanted to make it very, very natural, very, very down to earth, very, very unforced. He didn't want to make it weird. And so he came in a way that is easy for you not to recognize him. 
But because I had my friend Heidi say, go to the party, I went to the party. It was in the mansion house. You came in, there was a butler, a footman, there was gold. And uh, I went through with my flute and with my uniform. And they took me some down some steps in the garden, down to the river, onto a riverboat. I just made a killing. I had so much money from that party. And uh, I ate all the food and I drank like... Actually, they didn't let me drink. I was 12 years old. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I had to discover something. I had to take a risk. And this guy didn't want to make it Weird, And in a very profound way, when the Bible tells the story about God becoming a human being, he says, God didn't want to make it weird. Some of you, you, you're listening to me, you're in church, and you think, yeah, I'm not sure about the God thing, because where has he been all my life? Where has he been when I've been hurting? Where has he been when I've been questioning? I just don't know. I've never seen him. John says, you just maybe didn't recognize him. Because he comes in a way to not make it weird. And that's why the Christmas story is the opposite of the kind of ways that it's portrayed in the carols. In the carols is very much a kind of, I don't know, Victorian fantasy with animals all over the place and plucky innkeepers and Mary on a donkey and Joseph taking him with a dishcloth on his head and all these kinds of things. Actually, the Bible says is the very, very opposite. It was a very, very normal, obvious thing. So easy, so normal, so unpressured, so unforced. You could miss it. You could fail to recognize the God that was here in your midst. And so when Luke records the Bible reading that we had earlier, Luke says this. He says, while they were there, Joseph and Mary... The time came for the baby to be born. So it wasn't that Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem and it's a snowy night. Come on, it's the Middle East. Uh, And then suddenly she just, uh, out comes the baby. She's about to blow. No, she's there for a few days. And there's no way, if you have this image in your mind that they come and they're knocking on the doors and there's no room in the inn and the innkeeper takes pity on them and says, well, you can use my stable. And they go around the corner and suddenly all the animals are there. Actually, that's a romantic version. It's a nice version away in a manger, but that's not how it happened. It wasn't that weird. It was very, very normal. In a culture like that, in a town like Bethlehem, which is about six miles south of Jerusalem, six miles south of Jerusalem, south, south, six miles south, zero miles north, no miles south, six miles south of Jerusalem. And uh, they come in, and all Joseph has to do in this honor culture, which has a high value on hospitality, all he has to do is say, I am Joseph. Son of Heli, son of Mathat, son of Levi, I have the royal blood of the Davidic line flowing through my veins. And every door would be open to him. But this word, you see, it says, because there was no guest room available. That word guest room in the Greek, the Greek word there, is a particular word. It's the Greek word katalima. So katalima is a Greek word, and it just means a spare room. In other words, The Bible says there was no room for him in the spare room. Every house in that time, they had a guest room that you would use. They had such a high value on hospitality that they would have a whole house dedicated and given over to the uh, guests that they could expect to have. And so this is a floor plan from a typical Bethlehem house at the time. What you've got is you've got the whole family living in one room. They eat there, they sleep there, they live there, they cook there. Everything happens in that one room. Not good for privacy, but that's just peasant life. In where the doorway is, there would be a lower area. And that's where you kept your animals. But you kept your animals there at nighttime so that they wouldn't be stolen and so that they can provide um, heat at night. And then if you have anything about you, you'd have a catalima, a guest room, towards the end of the property or sometimes on the roof of the property so that guests could come there. 
And all that happens with Jesus is that their house is so full of other people that there's no room in the guest room. And so what they have to do, they clear the animals out of the lower area. They clear the men out of the house. And all the women, they gather around in the family living room. And there, when the time comes, Mary gives birth. And then they clean the manger, they put fresh straw in, they wrap the child up in strips of cloth, which was a a Middle Eastern first century tradition, and then lay him there. So why does the Bible emphasize the manger? Why does it talk so much about the manger? The reason is this, the manger was a sign. The manger was something to help you recognize. Because God says, I don't want to make it weird. I don't want to make it difficult for you. But I do want you to have a sign. I want you to have someone or something that points you in the right direction. And that's why when the angel speaks to the shepherds, the angel says this, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, which is what we call Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah of the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Just focus in on those two elements, a Savior and a sign. And it's like this. God says, listen, I understand you find it hard to believe in me. The thing is, I don't want to overwhelm you. I don't want to make it weird. I don't want to make it so that you have no choice. If God wanted, he could come down and leave us in absolutely no doubt whatsoever that he's real. But actually what he says is, I want to be your savior and I'm going to give you a sign. Wherever you find a savior, God will give you a sign. Wherever he comes to save us, to intervene, to help us, he will give us a sign. And the angels just say to the shepherds, look, this is the sign for you. The shepherds go, why don't you just take us? You've appeared to us. Why don't you just show us? Show us. Take us. Let us. Lead us there. But the angel said, no, listen. The way that God operates is he wants you to do the work. He wants you to have the choice to pursue him. To do your own choice. To choose him freely for yourself. That means he's not going to make it weird, but he will give you a sign. When he gives you a sign, then you can go follow that and see what happens. And that's the message that I want you to take home at Christmas. You may not have recognized God. You may not believe in him. You may call yourself an atheist or an agnostic or you're not sure or you're somewhere in the middle or you're on the fence. But God says, that's perfectly understandable. It's just that you maybe haven't recognized me. So let me give you a sign. And I guess something like this evening, this this service, it's a sign for you. A sign that says God is real. And you look around and you think, oh my goodness, everybody here is young. Everybody here is like me. Everyone here is ordinary. I can relate. This is a sign. A sign at Christmas, a sign that actually God is real. We, um, at this church, we have a lot of people coming and seeking God, looking for the signs, trying to find the Savior and searching. It's really normal for people to be here with us, sometimes for months on end, without ever having a faith. People come to us all the time, and they're atheists. One guy I spoke to, he comes in. He is here from about six months ago. He says, I'm an atheist. I say, what are you doing here? He says, I'm here because even though I'm an atheist, I see this one person in my life, and I've known them for years, and they're a Christian, and they go to this church, and there's something profoundly different about them. And even though we've had arguments and discussions and I haven't believed, I can't deny there's something that they have that I don't have. So I'm here to investigate. It's a sign and I want to seek. And so encouraged um, this guy just to start coming on Sundays, but also to do the Alpha course. The Alpha course, it's a course that we run every term. We're going to do our next one in January, end of the the month in January. And you come along, you have a meal, there's a speaker, it's usually me, and uh, don't let that put you off. And uh, then you get into a group, like-minded people, discussion, and you see where things go. We caught up, he'd been doing this, it was coming to the end of the Alpha course. I said, hey, let's go for a walk, let's talk uh, one day before Metro. I said, how are you doing? He said, oh, so, so good. He said, 
every time I come to church, I feel such joy. It's like nothing I've ever experienced before. I feel excited to be here. I said, how are you doing with Alpha? Oh, yeah, so many of my questions have been answered. So many of my questions are coming into focus. Uh, And I said, well, what's holding you back? He says, only one thing, Philip. He says, I have never felt God. I've never experienced him. He's never appeared to me. He's never spoken to me. And other Christians that I know, they talk about feeling God's presence and knowing God in it. I just never have any of that. And so although my intellectual questions have been answered, I don't feel them. I haven't ever had a sign. I said, well, hang on a minute. Just back up a second. Six months ago, you would call yourself an atheist. Yes, he says. Now, here, every time you come to church, you're filled with intense joy and excitement. He said, yes. I said, listen, if I had told you, or if anybody had told you six months ago that you going to church would inspire you with feelings of joy and excitement, how would you have reacted? He said, I would not have believed them. That was the furthest thing. That would just never be me at all. I said, listen, don't you think that's a sign? And suddenly he went, oh yeah, (laughs) I think maybe it is. Don't you think that maybe God is speaking to you? He said, oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I do think I am feeling God. And a couple of weeks later, after that conversation, he came up to me after the end of Metro. And he said, I've given my life to Jesus. And that is why we asked him to read that first reading. And you saw Jack at the very beginning. And he was the one that read that passage from John, talking about being the unrecognized God. And I said to him this evening, I said, how do you feel about it? He says, yeah, I am a believer and I want to do this and you can tell my story. And we chose Jack to do that reading because of his story. Also, because he has a super sexy voice (laughs) and uh, he's literally the voiceover guy. But that's what I want to leave you with. That's the message for Christmas. Christmas itself is a huge sign. Everywhere that you go, people are talking about God become flesh. People are talking about love. They're talking about hope. And what we want to tell you here is that this is real. This is true. And you can experience it for yourself. So it may be that you're here and this is all kind of washed over you and you think, yeah, carry on talking. I'm not buying it. I'm just here for the mince pies. And that's fine. We want you to enjoy this and just take whatever you can. But there'll be some of you and you're thinking, actually, maybe there is something. Maybe this is a sign that's worth following. Maybe I can go and do my own investigation. We've put together a little pack. Uh, It's a goodie bag that we would love for you to take away with you. What it's got in it, it's got a little booklet that uh, explains the real meaning of Christmas in a really simple way. And then we have this special Christmas version, Alpha Invitation to tell you the details of how you can sign up for our next Alpha course in January. And maybe you can find out too, as well as a copy of Luke's Gospel that we'd love you to take. But before we just crack on with our last two carols, I wonder whether you would just indulge me by praying a little prayer with me. We don't want to lay it on too thick and no one's under any pressure. And again, if this is not your bag, then that's fine. Just tap out. But for the rest of us, if you think, actually, I wouldn't mind praying to a God I'm not sure exists, but if he is there, on the off chance, maybe a prayer that says, God, if you're there, I'm open to know more. Give me a sign. I want to find you if you are there. That's all. And then um, you can, I'll pray the prayer so you don't have to worry about it. But if you hear what I'm saying, you think, yeah, I can go with that. Just do a little amen in the own your own uh, mind, just in private, without anyone hearing. But God will hear, and God will take you at your word. And after that, we're going to go big, and we're going to go loud, and we're going to turn it up to 11 and be totally inappropriate, because it's Christmas, damn it, and we're going to enjoy ourselves and uh, really let our hair down. So before we go wild, why don't you just close your eyes, uh, bow your heads, and uh, pray this prayer along with me. Here's a prayer. Make this Christmas prayer your own. Dear God, you know my life. You know where I'm at. You know my questions. You know the doubts that I have. I'm not even sure if you are there. 
But if you are real, if this stuff is true, if it changes lives, then please help me. Give me a sign that I can follow. Or help me recognize the signs you've already placed in front of me. Help me this Christmas to find what I'm looking for. I offer this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.